Ooh. Welcome to the Bay Area Urban Debate League Thursday um, open practice. And so today I would like to, you know, say hi to everyone and just say that anytime you feel like you've missed practice, you can watch this video. We're going to try to do better at providing more opportunities and more resources via our YouTube channel so that coaches at your school or if you want to have practices, um, 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 with yourself or, you know, or if you, again, miss a practice or if, you know, if a practice at your school has been missed, you can recoup with this. And so, yeah, so today what I want to do before we begin um, with something that's going to be very brief, but I, I think it's something that you should all, all know by like the back of your hand, right? And so before we get into the content of what you should know, like the back of your hand, I just wanted to do a quick um, icebreaker. So um, today at random, I'll guess, uh, I don't know, I'll just pick a random impromptu question. Who is your favorite musical artist right now? I'll start with Lucy. Um, right now, I really like Amy Winehouse. <gasps> hey, Amy. Okay, go ahead. Why? Why is that? Um, I really like Back to Black, that album. Uh-huh. Yeah, and just like all her music is really good. Okay, okay, good. Um, Sam? Um, it's either Cardi B or Elvis Crespo. Don't ask questions. Cardi B or Elvis Crespo? Why is that? I don't understand that. Where do you get, where do you get... Cardi B, bro. What do you know about Cardi B, Sam? Wow. All right. I see someone doesn't. Mm -mm. This is a good album. You're right. I love this album. Um, Yes, I have. I collect vinyl records, so I love music. So I don't know. I was looking at my music, so that's why I asked this question. Um, Cardi B, I love Cardi B. So the thing about Cardi B is I first would watch Cardi B on Love and Hip Hop because I'm a big hip-hop fan I grew up listening to hip-hop like real hardcore hip-hop like underground like um Wheezy F Baby Cameron Starface listening to like all the like uh, Mac Dre um all those type of rappers um and also listen to some like you know contemporary like commercial artists like Missy Elliott Lauren Hill you know those type of but Cardi B was one of those rappers that came from like I don't know, her story was always very interesting to me. And it was like when she made that first video, which was like, her first video wasn't a serious video. Her first video ever is like a comedic video. And so, and no one really knows that. Her real first video is like this parody type of thing. And it kind of blew up. And then she started from there making like more music related to like her, her past, you know? And then she got signed when she had that big hit. So I love Cardi B because I remember seeing Cardi B from the beginning, even before, like when she really started hustling. So I've always loved Cardi B for that because I remember when she really didn't have no music out and she was like trying to put her music out. And so, yeah, that's why I like Cardi B. And then you said Evers Presley, talented man, but- What don't... did you just say? You said Elvis Presley? I thought that's who you said. Who did you say? Crespo. Crespo. Suavemente, best yes, of there you go. <laughs> no quiero sentir tus labios. That's my song. Okay. <laughs> oh, and he, that's my tu sonrisa. Tu son okay, that's yes. Elvis Crespo. Actually, the first when I first moved here, and I um he was actually he was touring here, and like I just moved here, and it was two weeks into like me moving here, and he was here, and I was so mad I didn't get to go because I knew if I went, I was gonna be sweating. And we're gonna not talk about the other things because I'm recording, but I was gonna be sweating, having fun. <laughs> I was just gonna say I had, I was gonna have more than a few adult beverages. <laughs> yes, he's a good time. Uh, yeah, they still have the poster up for his tour on <laughs> near my. Yeah, I, I know. I see him sometimes around the city. Yeah, he's he's great Latin music. All right, and Amy. <laughs> um, I mean, it's probably gonna make me the odd one out, but um. I've been getting back into a band I was into in high school, My Chemical Romance. 
What do you um, mean? You're coming here. I know I have tickets. I bought them Aww. three years ago when they were first supposed to come here before COVID then of course canceled their, uh, they canceled the, uh, the concert and they pushed it back a year and then they canceled it again, pushed it back another year. So I bought these tickets three years ago and now I'm finally going to get to go see them. <laughs> They're my favorite band. I used to follow them on tour all over the East coast. Um, so I'm super, super excited. Yeah, My Chemical Romance reminds me of the time of, because I, I love My Chemical Romance. I would listen to Blink-182. Um, I love, well, my favorite band of all time is The Killers. That's my favorite band. Um, Kings of Leon, but also Evan Essence. Uh, that's my second favorite probably band. So that reminds me of those times. Like, I love My Chemical Romance. Yes. Um, okay, that was fun. That was fun. Okay. Oh, mine. I didn't do mine. My... Um, musical what have i been listening to a lot right now um well one i've been listening to a lot of beyonce recently honestly because her renaissance album dropped and i i really really enjoyed it um i thought it was really good it, first of all there's some like pieces that she brought in from like the past that really makes this album really a renaissance and so for that reason i was like okay that's cool and I think the other person I've been listening to, who, who have I been listening to? I can't think. Um, hmm. I would say, I don't know. I can't. Destiny's Child. <laughs> so more Beyonce. <laughs> I've been listening to, because I'm, I'm not a big, De I'm not a big Beyonce fan. I'm a, but I'm a huge Destiny's Child fan. Like I'm a huge Destiny's Child. Because I feel like Beyonce is the best when she's with Kelly and Michelle. Like, that's the best trio ever. Susanna, we're doing that icebreaker really quickly if you want to chime in before we get started. Um, is there a artist that you've been really listening to more than anyone else right now? Is there like an artist that you have on repeat? this question to me yes is there like an artist that you've been playing a little bit on repeat um brent Faisa. i don't know if that's how you say his name but brent Faisa. okay not sure i'm not familiar with who that yeah. is okay cool all right well things you should know like the back of your hand <laughs> so here we go me and amy will not say anything and we will of course you will have to explain all of this so you all go ahead let me see if we'll start with lucy can you explain the speech order for us but caveat lucy's gonna have a huge advantage because we literally just went over this yesterday that's fine <laughs> during Oakland Tech that's fine you're, you're competing at jack house so again all the things you should know like the back of your hand let's let's see like explain it yeah just explain this whole column of speech order oh okay so first is the one i see and it's eight minutes and you're just it's the advantage saying all their like constructing their arguments and everything they're going to talk about in the round. And then there's cross X. So the negative asks the advantage questions about their case that they just presented. And then the one NC is responding to everything from the case and presenting their off case arguments. And that's eight minutes. And then cross X, the advantage asks, or the F asks questions about what the neg just said. Uh, that's three minutes. And then the 2AC is responding to everything the negative just said uh, and extending arguments. And that's eight minutes again. And then negative ask questions about what they just said. That's three minutes, cross X. And then 2NC um, and 1NR is responding to everything the 2AC said and uh, extending arguments and that's eight minutes and then five minutes um and there's a uh, cross x the two ac or the uh, uh, the affirmative asking questions to the negative in between for three minutes after the two nc and then 
the 1AR is responding to everything the 2NC and the 1NR just said, and that's five minutes and extending arguments. And the, then, then the 2NR is uh, final sort of arguments and, and um, responding to the 1AR, and that's five minutes. And then 2AR is kind of final arguments and responding to the 2NR, and that's also five minutes. Yeah, that was great. Yep, got it. Great. Um, Sam, explain ass stock issues. Okay. So the ass stock issues are kind of the stuff that the AF has to put forward and prove um, in their case. So you have inherency, that the problem you're dealing with is a problem in the world. There's things like that. Um, harms, kind of like what the uh, problem is, the, you know, the reason why it's a problem. Um, solvency, how your plan solves for this problem. Significance, why your plan solving for that problem is significant. And then topicality, how that plan falls into the structure of debate this year. So in this case, the topicality is working within the United States federal government and NATO to increase cybersecurity. So you have to argue why you're topical in that case, why you fall under that um, definition. Yep, it's explaining why you are from the resolution. All right. And so Susanna, you want to explain um, the, the um, neg parts of a dissent. Susanna, are you there? Uh, do you want to go back to Lucy or Sam, or do you want me or you to do it? Um, Amy, why don't you take this one? Okay, so a disadvantage generally is like the opposite of an advantage. It's a bad thing that the affirmative plan causes to happen. Um, so there are a couple components. The first part is the uniqueness. This is the proof that the thing that you're claiming that the plan is going to cause is not currently happening now in the status quo. And there's also sort of a subcomponent to this called brink, which is basically arguing that it's it's not happening now but it's about to happen. So in the case of like, for example, a Russia disadvantage, it would be like US Russian relations are good now, but um, you know, tensions are high. The link is the connection from the disadvantage to the affirmative plan. So um, in the example of a Russia disadvantage, it would be like you make Russia mad and destroy US relations with Russia. And then the internal link is the connection between the link to the impact. So this would be something like, um, uh, if US Russian relations tank, um, US will or Russia will declare war. And then the impact is the bad thing that happens because of that. And so that would be something like Russia launches nuclear weapons, World War III, extinction would be the impact, the bad thing it causes. All righty. And then Lucy, do you want to explain answers to a dissent? So no uniqueness is basically just saying that either, I guess either the problem is already happening or it's very unlikely to happen, I guess. Uh, and then no link is saying that the plan wouldn't trigger the, like the uh, impact or the internal link. And then, no impact is saying that um that like oh no impact is saying that um the uh internal link doesn't lead to the impact or or the the impact wouldn't happen for some reason and then 
impact turn is saying that the plan actually solves for that impact, I think. So I, I was trying to follow you, I was making sure. So link turn is when you say that if they're saying that your plan causes something bad to happen, instead you say, no, we actually resolved that issue. So if, if your plan says, hey, you caused Russia aggressions, which caused for some fight to break out, which causes a nuclear war, then you would say, no, instead of creating tensions with Russia, we better diplomacy with Russia. So that would be a link term. And then in terms of impact term, impact term would look like more if, if, the, if they said, oh, well, you caused degradation to the environment. But then their argument is like, oh, well, degradation to the environment is a good thing because it makes scientists work better and work harder at resolving issues as it relates to, which is not the best argument, <laughs> but people do make arguments saying that sometimes impacts are <laughs> What'd you say? Land or sometimes argument. there's arguments that like, hey, running our economy to the ground is how we learn how to recover. So there's sometimes arguments <laughs> like that that happen. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I see. I it's think right I'm... the environment. So scientists are better able to stop it. Yes, and and again, that's probably not the best argument, but I've heard that argument before. And then also too, you you cannot do both at the same time. So be mindful of that. All right, and then um, I'll explain counter plans. So counter plans is basically where you have a plan that usually has a text that competes um, mutual um, that competes not mutually with the affirmative plan. Mm -hmm. So typically, sometimes it can be an affirmative that is topical, but most times most times it's a plan that's not topical so that it can be mutually exclusive. And there's different type of counter plans. There's agent specific counter plans. You have um, consult counter plans. You have time frame counter plans. You have all kinds of counter plans. And so basically um, those counter plans, um, a lot of times not only do they have some alternative to resolving the issue, but also they come with benefits that would not be benefits that could be assumed by the affirmative, right? And so um, there's that part of a counter plan. And then you also have how the, not only are these, there are additional advantages that the AF cannot assume, but there's also, um, you know, we solve. And typically it's not that just we solve the counter plan, but we also solve better than what the affirmative would. All right, and so those are parts of a counter plan. And then let's see who has not, let's go to Susanna. Susanna hasn't answered one yet. Susanna, um, answers to our counter plan. Can you okay. go over that? Yeah, okay. So um, legit term, I think is do both. Do the counter plan and the plan at the same time. Um, time frame term is like do the counter plan first or do the case first and then do the other one. Um, intristic perm. Oh, I do not remember that. Intrinsic perm is when you look outside of, you find some- Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> do it through a different person or like not through like the federal government, do it through- Nope, 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 nope. Nope, okay. <laughs> it's do Amy. the plan and the counter plan and oh. something else. So a brand new thing that wasn't part of the plan or the counter plan before. Um, so it might be something like if my plan is NATO should do it and or your and so your plan is NATO should do it. My counter plan is EU should do it. And then you say perm, the UN should do it too. Why not? Let's all do it. Right, like that would be intrinsic. You're adding something brand new, somebody who was not involved in this before. That's an intrinsic perm. There's a lot of debate about why that's illegitimate, both back and forth. Yeah, and just just that example is not specific to agent. It could also be specific to like just the function of the text. So the function of the text don't doesn't have to just be the agent. So it's just any new thing, new development um, that could be benefit. You know, that's not already proposed by the counter plan or the ad. And then severance perm. Uh, 
Um, okay, sorry, I spell me here. Severance perm, I think, is to like back out of, yeah, to, to cut something, a part of the um, counter plan, and then do that. Yeah. Oh, wait, okay. Um, no net benefit. That's. No net benefit is, I forgot what net benefit is, to be honest. Like, to be totally honest. I don't think you, maybe you didn't come back at the time. Um, so no net benefit. So I said a net benefit is basically um, something that the affirmative cannot assume as an advantage that only the counter plan can assume as an, advan as an advantage or a, a, or a, or a benefit that is coming from the counter plan. So a lot of times it could be a disad, um, or it could be brought by the mutual 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 exclusivity of not doing the um the affirmative plan. So it could be okay. two of those things. And so it's like having some ad 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 additional advantage, right? And so you are basically either going to do two things. You're either going to explain how it's probably not mutually exclusive, so there is no net benefit, or you would just answer the dissent. So that's kind of like no net benefit. Okay. Um, and then no solvency is basically that counter plan doesn't solve. And then solvency turn, you can just be like, oh, the case solves um, better, or the case solves in, um, in that way, and theirs doesn't. That would still be no solvency. Remember, a turn is when you you say it's the opposite of what they're claiming it does. Um, so, so it would be saying that the counter plan actually makes it worse. It doesn't just uh, not solve, it makes the situation worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sam, critique man. <laughs> what are the parts of a critique? <laughs> All right. So parts of K. One is the link. So this is how the affirmative argument links to your K. For example, if I'm running a capitalism K, my link would be the affirmative plan runs within the confines of capitalism. Therefore, it links the plan. Um, you have your impact. So what does linking to capitalism do? In my case, it would mean linking to capitalism leads to using capitalism more, right? It's a compound perpetuation of using capitalism. And therefore, all the effects and problems of capitalism, like climate change and social inequity, are all an impact of continuing to use capitalism. So that's that. Um, the alternative is something we can provide um, as an alternative to doing the plan, or we, which links to capitalism. We can do an alternative, something else. And the framework is kind of how we view um, the lens of the debate. So the idea would be is that, uh, for example, if we're through the framework of pedagogies of the oppressed, you know, the stories of people who are oppressed as opposed to looking at the framework of, you know, corporate America or something, then <laughs> we're able to better view, you know, how we should actually be making plans that focus more on oppressed people and people of color and things like that, as opposed to viewing, oh, we can make more money like this, or, oh, you know, we can continue the use of capitalist system and things like that. And so, you know, changing the framework allows us to view things differently, which will help you in the end to defeat the F with your K. All right. And then, um, Lucy, how do you answer a critique? Um, so first is the perm, and then all the different perms are the same from the counter plans. Um, and then no impact slash turn is that the impact won't happen or the impact is good, I guess. And then no alt slash turn is that the alt, uh, I guess the alt doesn't solve or the alt causes the opposite to happen. And then framework is just responding with a different kind of way of viewing debate, I guess. And then, um, theory, I guess the example is K is bad. So like theory about K is being good or bad for debate. 
And sometimes theories are not just about K's being bad. Um, sometimes theory is just about like how K's are conducted in debate. Sometimes maybe potentially not useful depending on their method, depending on their framework. So it just really depends. So just know that all theory arguments won't be saying K's are bad, but some of them will say that too. Um, just be mindful of that. Um, you missed a perm, but I'm gonna have Amy just answer. Um, do this one. What's the double bond perm? Um, so the double bind perm is um, basically saying that you're you're forcing your opponent to admit one of two things, and either way, that's what a double bind is in general, right? Either way, one of these two things is true, but either way, it's good for me, right? Either way, you lose. So in the case of a critique, a double bind perm, you're saying the first if the first thing is true, it's that the perm works. Both my plan and the critique alternative can happen at the same time. The perm, perm works, in which case I win, right? If the perm works, I win. Or the second thing is true, which is that if the perm doesn't work, there, therefore it must fail, right? But if the perm fails, if my plan is enough to disrupt the solvency of your alternative, then it was never going to work in the first place because there's a thousand things happening all the time that are potentially even worse than my plan. So if my plan is enough to disrupt your alt solvency, then one of those things would have anyway, which means the alt fails, which means I still win. So either way, one of these two things must be true. Either the perm works and I win or the perm doesn't work and I still win. Um, and that's a double bind perm. Uh, I also just really want to point out really quick theory. I think a big theory thing this year, because theory, remember, is just um, us debating about the norms of debate, the rules of debate. I think a really big thing this year, especially on just counter plans, not even just critiques, but it's going to be fiat theory, um, especially international fiat. Should the negative be able to fiat international entities when the affirmative cannot fiat NATO? You know, probably not. And in the case of uh, critiques, you have things about fiat theory about like, utopian fiat and all that kind of stuff so fiat theory is i think probably the most common theory on critiques there's also reflexive fiat or something like that um but yeah so there's you know again you know stay abreast <laughs> of these things that you probably should need to know as we are trying to go over them now um i'll do how about susanna you you instead um do parts of topicality Um, okay. So interpretation, I think it's like you offer an interpretation of a specific word that they use and say why it doesn't um, meet the requirement or whatever, or like it doesn't do what they say it does. And then violation. Um, You kind yeah. of already said violation. You kind of combined. Yeah, you combined um, it. So yeah. Yeah. The interpretation is just how you define how you meet the topic's resolution, how you affirm the topic, or how they don't affirm the topic, I should say. And then how that definition has been violated. And so yeah, you already said that. So go to standard. Um standards is standards where you're basically saying what the standard like you you show them you say what the definition should be or something yeah you're, you're there yeah. yeah it's basically why your definition should be preferred why they should not violate why staying within these limits of the resolution is important and oh well i just said the last one go ahead <laughs> um and then voters is why it's important like you said <laughs> And why they should vote on your definition. Yes. I am uh, yeah. Lucy or Susanna. Can you guys name some limits, some standards? One of them's limits. Don't say limits. Because <laughs> both Mathino and I said limits already. Um, so other than limits, can you guys name any other standards that you would use in a top quality show? Ground. <laughs> yes, ground is a great one. Like I said, Lucy has an edge because we covered this yesterday. So what is what is ground? Um, the amount of like the amount of kind of topics or like cases that you can and arguments actually that each team can make. 
Yeah, perfect. That's exactly what it is. Uh, can anyone name like just one more, Sam? Fairness, education. Those are voters. Oh, voters. This is actually, when we talked about this yesterday, yeah. Oakland Tech did the exact same thing. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> word for word, they said education and, and fairness. Those are voters. And okay. those voters are true for, because technically topicality is really just theory. So education, fairness, um, clash, those are voters for any theory argument, including topicality. So in two, ground limits, what's Nick, yeah, can you guys name one more? Ground limits, one more. You could do, oh, Susanna, go ahead. Mm, I, I think you just said it, but like, wasn't it like class? You said it worked for topicality. That's a voter. Okay. Usually, <laughs> class is a voter. But something like predictability, um, bright line. I was gonna say bright line. Um, um, predictability is another one. Did you say predictability? Already? I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, or reasonability is another one. Yeah. Um, field context. Um, jurisdiction and limits is kind of the same. Jurisdiction is a voter, I thought, because you're saying like jurisdiction is you saying that well, the jury true. literally doesn't have the jurisdiction of vote. Oh yeah, you did. Okay, yeah, you're right. See, even we get them; they all kind of mesh together eventually. Um, I think that's most of them. Yeah. All right, um, and I guess I'll do answers to T. Um, basically, the negative team has a definition, and so you provide a counter definition. Um, well, that's the uh, well. Let me start with the first one. You basically explain how you meet the definition, right? And so you explain, hey, our affirmative does meet within this definition. Here's how we work to meet that definition, and somehow, somehow they explain how the topic or how they add works within the confines of the topic and then you have like like i said prior uh counter definition and then you explain how your counter definition um sometimes you want to explain why the counter definition interpretation or um, definition is better for the standards of the the of the reason why the neg team has their standards um or sometimes it's good enough to just meet them as well um and then you also talk about the voters and how sometimes you need a reverse voting issue. Maybe again, um, why your interpretation is the best for engaging in the resolution. And yeah, I think that's it within this thing. So get familiar. You should be, I think you all sound pretty familiar, but make sure that if you know, if you haven't become familiar and if you're a little bit more weary, you know, just review this a little bit more. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a great tool to do what Toya Green, who's a guest often for Bottle, uh, always says, which is remember your parts. This is what she's talking. These are the parts <laughs> that Toya Green talks about. When we say remember your parts, these are the parts you need to remember. So this isn't just like a sheet so that you can like see, oh, this is what the word means. Like if you run a dis ad and that's what you're going to go for in the 2NR, you need to make sure all of the parts, the uniqueness, the length, the internal length, the impact, make it all the way to the end, all the way to the 2NR. Um, so that's what this sheet is useful for, especially. And let me just add to that. So one of the things that my debate coach said to me the last time I saw her was like, if you want to do the fancy stuff, like if you want to do the fancy stuff that you see people doing, whether it's dancing, Buddhism, I don't know. If you want to read uh, Nietzsche, whether you want to do the stuff that Sam is doing, whether you want to do the hokey pokey, I don't know, <laughs> whatever you want to do in debate. But if you want to do some of the fancy stuff, you need to know your parts. You need to know the basics. Like you can't say, oh, I saw somebody do some cool stuff in this debate round. I want to do it too. If you don't know your parts, like A, um, you have to be, a, there are debaters out here who do understand their parts and why their parts are important. And that's why they're going to run framework against you, right? And so, um, and, and defend why, you know, those parts are important. And so you should know your parts because even if you decide to cast away the debate norms, there's people who are upholding debate norms and for, and they, and, and not to say that there aren't good reasons for upholding those norms. The same reason why, you know, upholding whatever you're upholding would be just as important. Um, but yeah, moving forward. So, and then um, not only should you know your parts, but it's just good to be able to like, you know, be able to gauge the lingo as well. 
um, and being able to know the purpose of like how what what is knowing how to like purpose your arguments as well. I think that's a good reason for knowing your parts. Um, so we're going to end this recording here. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me via Slack. Um, uh, um, any, I probably should have said this earlier, for any of our um, people who are watching um, at home, you can always start and stop this at your discretion. Also, educators who are using this for their school sessions, for debate classes, and or for the debate practices, you can also start and stop at any time. Any student or coach and or teacher who needs to email me about any of the content here, they can. This is just a simple, quick overview of what we um, go through in policy debate, but there will be individual um, slides and presentations made available for each one of those particular positions in debate, whether it's AF or NAG. And we'll also go do another, um, I'm sure Sakai has already recorded um, content about speech order. And so you'll see more resources like this again through our YouTube page. So please, please, please make sure you um, continue to check out our page to see the video rollout this year, which I hope to and inundate you more with more videos this year than I did last year so that you have a lot more to work with within your classrooms and to prep for tournaments. All right. Well, see you all. Bye. Okay. No, don't leave the meeting. I just need to stop the recording. Okay, there.